The sorcerer's objective is to break the fixation of social interpretations and to see energy directly. To see is a total perceptual experience. Seeing energy as it flows is an imperious need on the path of knowledge. Ultimately, all the effort of sorcerers is guided to that end. It is not enough for a warrior to know that the universe is energy. He has to verify it for himself. Carlos Castaneda, Encounters with the Narwhal by Armando Torres. All right, I'm here with a special guest, Beth Martins. You can find her work at bethmartins.com. That's M-A-R-T-E-N-S. Dot com. She does work with archetypes, with the primal powers that come into the world with us and walk by our sides and stay with us until we leave this world. A lot like the work of Carl Jung, she quotes and uses Lester Levinson, but her program is excellent for people that are trying to make a change in their life. Just about any kind of change, whether it be become more of the totality of yourself, become more authentic, release old programs, deal with uh, old childhood wounds and trauma, uh, change your business model. Basically, it's a, a leveling up or an upgrade process. So without further ado, here we go. Interview podcast with Beth Martins. Thank you very much, Beth. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome, Beth Martins. Thank you for taking the time to uh, speak to me and share your your work uh which primarily for me is on archetypes but but also on just really digging deep into uh your inner self and releasing old programs old patterns as you say on your website deprogramming the new world order so welcoming good morning Thank you so much for hosting me. And uh, that's the New World Disorder. I, re I renamed it. <laughs> that's correct. The New World Disorder. Exactly. So there's, I mean, there's so many places we could go, you know, with, with just that right there. But um, I'm going to start by reading a couple paragraphs uh, that are about energy. And because to me, when I did your course, which was so helpful for me, um, and it wasn't new, this type of work is not new to me. I've been doing this for a long time. But your course structure and the way you do it and the way you speak to people um, and sort of hold hold and, and guide that space was very effective for me. And for me, it, it really is in a lot of ways um, energy work or work in the spirit. You could even say it's holy work. So um, to that. yeah, so I'm going to read from this book, uh, Armando Torres. It's called Encounters with the Nogwal. One of the most powerful books that I've ever read in my life. I've read it. I've reread it. I've made an audiobook version of it that's online that I actually made for myself because it's so cryptic that I have to keep listening to it to understand deeper layers of meaning. Mm. But what I'm going with this is that your work and this work to me are the same work. They're just in different uh, syntaxes or different types of language. So um, I'm just going to read the read read these things to you, and then you see what how you react, and you see what you think, see where where it'll take you, and you can highlight um, your work when when you hear these things. So let's see here. All right, life is formed when a portion of the free energy of infinity, which the old seers call the emanations of the eagle, is encapsulated by an external force becoming a new individual being aware of himself. And they saw that the perception of the world happens when something they call the assemblage point of perception comes into play. Uh, yeah, okay, so that, that's um, very interesting. I, I like the concept of assemblage point. Um, you know the the mystery of of life how how creation happened how form came into be i study it uh every single day and especially with regard to how um you know i've got this new word from the zodiac and the salts of salvation about etching reality 
through the brain, right? Like that, that God energy, the free energy that's, that they're talking about uh, goes to work etching. You know, I think there is a, 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 like a brain artifact. It's not, it's not the brain or happening at the level of the flesh, but I do believe that's, that's a, a big part of it because the, you know, the cerebellum, or the cerebrum cerebellum relating to the word seed, seri, how a seed grows. I'm in, in the midst of, uh, actually, I just ran high speed for my garden, you know, planting seeds and watching seeds grow and, and watching that life force explode out of seemingly nothingness or, or, or something so small and minute. And yet it's so packed with life. If you give it some love and attention, otherwise that seed is, is never going to actualize and become anything without somebody uh, stewarding that life into into being same as a you know mother giving birth from the womb or um, all, you know all all the way the ways that life comes into creation and um, so I'm not sure if I can say anything exactly more of that except that we are so much more creators than we could ever possibly know and you know when you look around in your life and you see what you have whether you like it or you don't like it maybe parts of your life you like and parts you don't it's all come from that seed and you applying your conscious you know free will of choice for example that i'm going to cultivate this seed or i'm going to study that knowledge and bring about this thing to being like the the course for example that that you did it was it was really in seed stage it was just an online course i often added it to coaching programs but when the whole pandemic hit then i knew that work was coming very forward for me it kept pushing up out of me saying beth beth i need your attention right now this is important and, uh, and then so it birthed and it became, you know, a first course and a second course and all of the materials around it and it came to life and so many people had uh, a good experience with it and were able to continue to use it. So I don't know if that helps to speak to what you were reading. But Yeah, of course it does. I mean, um, these, these things I'm reading, this book is extremely abstract in its language. Um, and that's why the syntax is, it's actually designed that way to sort of like, you know, um, what do you call it? Sort of like uh, parables or uh, sutras that you have to meditate on. Um, they're seeds. So they're seeds. <laughs> so you know, I'm I'm into etymology, and so when I when I look at seed, it's the same root is of that word is to see, and I and I actually see you as a seer, and I did right away before I even took your course. I'm like, ah, oh, she's she's a seer. And uh, I know that's a, a broad, loose term. And it's it's not that you see everything. You know, it's not that you have all the answers, but you see a specific, um, you have an awareness that you've cultivated that maybe some other people don't. And so when, so you get to see deeper or, you know, let's say more clearly into that awareness. And so I see you as a seer and the word seed with a D on the end of it is to see, uh, but the letter D, and I know a lot of people won't understand this, but when you study etymology, the letter D actually, the symbol itself actually does act as a door. It's actually, it's a, it's a curved Delta. And it, it means, it means to begin something hmm. or to end something. Like hmm. when you put ED on the end of a word, like, uh, you know, composed, the door has it means you've ended something on the end of a word, but oftentimes when it's at the beginning of a word, it means to open. So a seed is when you see something and you've completed it, you under, you have full understanding or let's say substance. So and I also was just hearing uh, contained it, right? Like at, at, at the beginning of the writing, taking that free energy life force and, and putting a case on it. Which yes. It always has. Yes, exactly. That's interesting you say that because in the Toltec tradition, they talk a lot about the uh, luminous cocoon. And it's just, it's the energy. If, if we, you know, I'm not going to reread that paragraph, but what it's saying is, is that somehow uh, the energy sort of divides itself and enfolds itself and then contains itself and becomes independent. It becomes its own thing. And so every human being has a, lumin a luminosity about them, 
has a luminous cocoon. And that's for their own protection, but it's also because the universe is infinite and we can't concentrate or be aware of its entirety because it's overwhelming. So we sort of shield ourselves and we're only aware of, let's say, what's very important to us at that time. But we're still connected on the other side of that luminous cocoon to it all. And, and so this is where I'm kind of going with this is that your work to me is a movement of the assemblage point. And I think all, you know, all spiritual tra traditions are the shamanic tradition is, um, is to make you aware of, let's say a new mental space, a new emotional space, um, even a new physical space. But of course, all of that process is spiritual. And so what I see you doing is I see you guiding people at least you did for me, you know, I took your primal power course, the, those five main archetypes that we all have from birth till death. And I can see you guiding me and I've been guided before. So I I'm like, I'm ready for this. You know, some people, we have all our resistances, but, um, I was able to allow you to, and trust you to guide me, uh, to move my assemblage point to illuminate what they call luminous fibers, uh, that are, always they're always um uh we always have access to them but through our patternings and our programming we shut and resist we shut a lot of them off and so you know you're able to guide me and uh, and others to illuminate parts of themselves that they're that are hidden that really we ourselves uh create the hiding spaces for does that make sense yeah, I love that, and I'm and I'm getting that uh, reference point more so now, and uh, and it's exactly it's exactly the case that if if I'm understanding it correctly, the tendency is to default to a certain place, right? We have past yes. experiences that have um, carved grooves in in our consciousness in in the brain, and you know, God knows exactly what that is. But I've seen that, you know, in in early life experimenting with psychedelics i literally saw it the, the pinging and, and the traveling through well-traveled spaces some good some bad and and they're like ruts that you get stuck in so uh you know it, one of my examples was if you look out into the world right now and the people who are drinking the kool-aid and they're afraid of the boogeyman their the reference point is is really low it's in it's in apathy, it's in grief, it's fear at, at best, right? That's a high, that would be a high point there. And, and so you can learn to raise yourself up that scale of, of uh, experience or, or emotion. You know, it, it's not just emotion. I, I think that's, that's a pretty shallow word for that. But, but it, you know, it's, that, it's that human experience that we tend to habitually default in one place or another. So you can raise that reference point and, and, and you could potentially raise it all the way to the highest reference point, which is uh, not unlike where you exactly are. You're there. It's just that if the attention isn't going in that direction, it can seem like it's not there. And everything in your life will play out in a way like it's not there. It might like even be the opposite. Uh, I was I was just interviewing Dr. Berlando yesterday, and this fits in so much. Yeah, I, I, I saw that interview. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I need to watch that like six more times. My mind was so blown after, but I really, it, it brought home another level and layer of that. Same with all the studies in law that I've been doing. And, you know, to, to be able to come from that higher place, whether it's, you call it the upstream or the higher jurisdiction, uh, the, the knowledge of who you are and what you are actually made of this luminous cocoon, which I love your, I love your phrase, that, that phrase that you're using. And so, and so if that becomes your vantage, where you see from, you become a seer, you become that, that, that place. And I'm not going to, for one second, pretend that I have, uh, you know, that I spend all my time there, but there's enough over 20 years since saving my life uh, from cancer this way that I have practiced over and over again. And the, the desire for freedom gets stronger and stronger. It pulls me forward and it, it's no longer tolerable to default in very low, you know, I'll, I'll touch down there and 
it, it just will be so painful for me. I can't stay. Uh -huh. So yeah. it, it's sort of self-fulfilling in a beautiful way. It keeps like, yeah, I can go higher. I can do more, uh, not do more, but I can be in a higher vibration where everything downstream isn't, isn't an obstacle anymore because the higher energy is always winning is a, is probably not an accurate term either, but it, it has the most powerful draw on it. Yes. Um, you mentioned, you know, freedom, the Toltecs would call that state, that higher state. They call it two things. They call it total freedom. And they also call it the totality, recovering the totality of oneself. Both those things are the same. And, and so um, they say that this is the whole reason why we're here is to recover the totality of ourself, right? And they say that as, a, as an infant, well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, you come out of a womb, which is a, is a cocoon. And so that's a sort of physical manifestation of it. Then you come out into this world and they say, well, you're actually still in an embryonic state. You're still in a cocoon. It's just much more subtle and nuanced. And so that's why we have that perception of this sort of our, our, our boundaries, our, the boundaries of our awareness is our, our cocoon. And that can be expanded infinitely if you spend enough time there. Um, but I also, so I also wanted to, to say, you know, recovering the totality of oneself is just also another way to say that is just uh, apophatic learning or unlearning. Mm. So as a what child, word? apophatic, apophatic, there's a word for that. <laughs> yes. I, in my, in my very first book, the, 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 I, the very first intro, I, I call it woe and apophenia. And I know that's a kind of a big word, but it's basically the woe that we go through when we uh, agree to unlearn. It's mm -hmm. like, it's daunting, right? So um, the apophatic knowledge is what a lot of the, uh, the great philosophers and great mystics would say, this is actually real knowledge is just because we already have knowledge, right? Like I think Socrates said that, you know, everything is just is unlearning, right? Because you already have it all in you. And um, society and culture and your mother and father and your family life, and they implant all these different um, concepts, ideas, beliefs, um, you know, into the, into the wide open, innocent child. And the idea is, at least for the Toltecs, is like you have to spend most of your energy in your life undoing all those things, not because they're necessarily incorrect. Some of them might be correct, but they're not yours. They're, they're foreign. They're someone else's. And they also call that the foreign installation that's been installed in you. And we're completely unaware of this, right? Until we get to a certain point where we become aware of it and we're like, oh, okay, now the work, now the work begins, right? Um, but I also wanted you to just kind of, if you can, just maybe briefly go through the stages. Uh, you know, you talked about grief and, um, and uh, apathy, but maybe for the audience, you could just go from the bottom to the top so that we have a context for that in, in your work. Sure. And this roots back to the work of Lester Levinson, who was alive in the 1950s and uh, almost died of a double heart attack, had to find out as a, as a, genius that he was how to not die <laughs> and uh so he he did that and in the process this is a very abridged version but in the process he did discover what's called it he called it a scale of action i call it a scale of emotion just because action can be a, a just you know a little bit less of a descriptive invitation to someone to understand so uh just to simplify it a little bit and and so there's the the two scales one is called egg flap the, the, in, the, in the lower energy, the higher energy is called CAP, just as acronyms for, for memorizing, which are incredibly handy. Because as soon as you know egg flap CAP, you're like off to the races with what I call spiraling through, through the scale. And so it is representing a natural order of, of um, human experience. You know, it's hard to project that onto anyone else or see my cat on this scale or anything like that. And, and so it begins in the lowest possible human experience of apathy. That's no feeling. That's not caring. That is the disease that humanity on the whole is suffering. 
And um, it's been, our experience has been so badly weaponized against us. There's so much inner pain at the physical and the psychic level that there's every reason for us to vacate and go into apathy, right? It's an evacuation yeah. of your own being. And if you're brave, you're going to move up to grief where you're going to start to actually feel that pain and, and it's sorrow and sadness. And you're, you're probably going to be in a place of victim feeling like why me or poor me is happening. And again, if you, if you rise into the next um, natural ordered place, that's already there, you don't have to invent this. It's, it's literally there waiting to be discovered and uh, played with and traveled on in a path, in a spiral. Uh, the next stage is fear. So when you are in that place of fear, obviously you're, you got a big no to everything. There's the, the imperative, I must save my life. This is scary. I need to reject or get away or whatever your fear causes to do, causes you to do. Could be freezing, could be running, could be fighting, all of that kind of thing. Fighting is probably less likely in fear, but will be more likely up in uh, in in the next two realms. The, the, the next one is actually lust, which is really interesting. When you see people who default into lust, they love their lust because it's higher than fear, grief, and apathy. It gets them up and out of it. So you know you can easily feel very comfortable in your lust because it's not in those other lower energies. And that strong desire, it's it's a paradox that. You cannot really have something until you stop wanting it. So lust is a very big obstacle. And, it, and as you know, when somebody's lusting for you, say, it, you know, in a sexual way, in a relationship way, it's it's not very nice. It's 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 actually um, a uh, an assault of sorts. You know, not to over dramatize, but uh -huh. there is a, energetically, it's it's, it's not like, a nice thing. It's like psychic violence. It you know. really is. I found this inside myself big time and I went to work. I'm like, that's it. I'm just going to let this go, you know, whatever. And my, my lust can equally be for my work and for creation and for all kinds of things, but it's lust nonetheless. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter if it uh, falls in one category or another. To rise up out of lust, you have anger waiting for you. So say women have a harder time to feel anger. They might want to default down into desire and passion and you can see how that's become very celebrated in, say, the last decade. It's all about your passion. Passion really means to uh, suffer. <laughs> so to rise up out of the suffering of that, of that strong desire, the anger will come. And you can start to take action. You've moved up and out of the victim side of the ag flap scale into the killer side of the ag flap scale where action is much more possible. It's called, also called the causal side where you turn into more of a perpetrator, kind of like we talked about lust. Anger is more obvious where you will, you know, attack people who instead of, instead of cowering and, and being afraid and hiding your head under the covers, you might attack back. You might go on the offense and start attacking people. We see that with the pandemic so much that yep. the, the truthers in their higher energy will take it upon themselves to smash somebody in a mask or who decided to get a jab or all of that kind of thing. And uh, anger is handy because it does wake you up out of your sleep in, in my archetype world to, to if the, of the hero's journey to come up and out of the denial of the child. You need the rebel and the rebel's almost always up in arms, getting pissed off about what's going on. So it has a certain place, but it's not the destination. And to rise up into the next layer, it's, it's all about pride. Pride is a special trap. It's very high energy, but it's uh, very much hidden from the person that's experiencing that. They, uh, Lester said pride is a hide. Mm -hmm. These are all the experiences. It starts to, it starts to um, accordion folder out here. So you've got jealousy and guilt and the sense of, again, rejecting someone and asserting your separateness from other people. That's very important to somebody who's in pride. It can also be that superiority, inferiority, which is the same kind of thing. And uh, it's very destructive. I, I feel like most of the destructive movements take place in pride. You, eugenics, for example, is right. It's, it's yeah. our genes are superior, even though we're like, you know, our, our blood is so blue, it has no oxygen and we're dying and we need artificial means to prop ourselves up and, and, and constantly vampire energy from people, you know, on the form of money or whatever it is. 
So it takes a, a ton of courage to jump up and out of pride, uh, you know, a strong will as you have to, to do the study of the self and see what is happening here. Am I getting the results I want? Like you said, the totality, the pride is kind of the antithesis of the totality experience because you're always asserting your separateness and therefore mm. cutting yourself up into bits and pieces. And so that jump up to cry, uh, up to uh, pride, the, the, the beginning of the cap scale is a very big one and it's a, an important one. It's where humor shows up. It's where you're going to do the thing that you were afraid to do. Of course, courage and, and fear mirror each other. So you can sometimes jump right from fear up to courage. We didn't talk about that that much in, in the, uh, in the course, but, uh, that's, that's an, uh, you know, kind of like snakes and ladders and then uh, that's not a good analogy because there's no jump in that game. It's only sliding down, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes you can jump. Uh, and uh, so, uh, of course, you can take a lot more action and it, it's high defaulting in courage, for example, entrepreneurs, people who are willing to take responsibility for themselves, so, you know, people who are like yourself, you're willing to get out, be seen, uh, risk cri being criticized, risk somebody not liking or putting a dislike on your on your video or something like that. And uh, when you when you rise up the scale again, you're going to go into acceptance. Acceptance extremely powerful. If you cannot accept something that's happening in your own system, then you'll maintain your separateness from it. You it will you will stave off your wholeness mm -hmm. just by just by moving into acceptance of what is there. You know your biggest fear. It, it, we, we suppress it. You don't want it to come up. You think, oh, I'm going to manifest it. And, and for, for certain, I'll feel the pain of it. So you can learn like, oh yeah, from my courage, I can go into acceptance and I can just not only accept that that possibility is there, but I could accept the whole imagine, you know, the, the imagination of playing it out. I can let it happen right now. That's very deep acceptance. Deep, it, it's deeply rooted acceptance. And, and as a result, you can, I've been digging, uh, you know, dandelions and, and thistles. So I've got this image in my brain. You can pull that root right from mm -hmm. the bottom, right from, you know, where it goes teeny tiny and has all the little threads and it comes right out clean and it's beautiful. So satisfying. So that's, that's the energy work. You know, that's energetic for sure. Exactly, exactly. So that's the power of acceptance and then moving up. Now, acceptance, you're still not free, by the way. You're <clears throat> you're getting higher, but it's not freedom. The next level is the biggest level of all. It's called peace. And it includes a huge range of experience, you know, including joy and ecstasy and, you know, God's making love to me and uh, what we call happiness and love and all kinds of things. Although love, you know, you get into semantics here with words, it's, there's a lot of overlap, but you know it for yourself. It's some kind of peace. Uh, it's not actually a resting place. Peace is beautiful. You love peace. I'll take peace over apathy, grief, fear, lust, anger, pride any day. Uh, but it's not the destination. It's actually kind of a trap like pride. It's a next, next level trap because spiritual people get addicted to their peace and they want to stay there. They want to hold on to that. But guess what? It's a spiral experience. So once you get to peace, you're not done. There's, there's a next level, next layer. And what's on the heels of peace in the scale of uh, emotion or action is apathy, right? So you find so many people in the spiritual world are really an apathy claiming to be in peace, but they're just saying like, oh yeah, that's not my problem or nothing affects me. I'm unaffected, you know, blow a bomb off in my backyard. And I'm just like a Buddha. I'm just going to sit here and ohm my way through it. Well, that's not caring. That's not reacting. That's not, we're not here to, to go numb to the world outside and for sure not uh, to the world inside. So you have to keep going. That's my motto, especially for 2021. Keep going. <laughs> if you don't keep going, then you're going to get stuck there. And then so when you get when you start defaulting and your reference point is in the higher energy of cap, then you can really start to play. Again, courage will give you the ability to play with it. And you say, oh yeah, well, I'm in such high energy. What if I let this high energy go? What if I'm brave enough to, to see what's behind it and risk losing it 
Now, the beauty is that 100% of the time when I let go of high energy, there is freedom on the other side. It's the same with the low energy. If you let apathy go and you and you get it from the roots of the of the programs that hold that scale uh, rigid, if you could call it that, or, or seemingly unmoving, then you can uh, you can make the ultimate jump to a state of to, of totality of, of your experience, wholeness. You are no longer split into even the scale will disappear. Uh, the archetypes disappear. Everything that you use to reference your experience will will disappear. It is that totality, right? So that's that's the wholeness. Of- that's excellent. That's so it's so great to go through all the steps and have you explain it like that. Thank you very much. Um, My pleasure. It's it, fun. It it, <laughs> it 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 does remind me. Okay, okay. Again, I'm relating this to my Toltec te- learnings. You know. They talk about four stages uh, that we all go through if you want to become a person of knowledge. And not everybody wants to become a person of knowledge. Now, there's only four stages, but basically they kind of encompass all those stages you kind of just said, but maybe in a, um, a, a you know, more broad sense. And um, they also talk about, you, you mentioned about being in uh you get to certain stages they give way to other stages and you kind of feel like say peace you kind of feel like you've made it but you said the word well it's it's also kind of a trap and so they say the same thing um and just just ironically you know if you spell trap backwards it's part Ooh. so when you when you are only a part of something you're not all of it you're not whole right? So we, that's how trap, trap kind of works. We set, like you said, we separate ourselves. Um, but what they would say is there's, there's four natural enemies to a person, uh, on the path of knowledge. The first one is fear. And they say it's, it's an extremely daunting and, and vicious, you know, um, enemy to conquer. And, but once you do, it gives way to clarity once you conquer fear, you enter into a state of clarity. And they say, it's not that you will never have fear in your life again. It's just that it will never have power over you again. You will recognize it. It'll still be there from time to time, but you have defied it so many times that it's no longer has that power over you. And you can see clearly. And so people think, okay, if you're, if you're following this, now I'm in clarity. Great. I can rest here, right? But then the Toltec says, no, clarity is actually your second enemy. So you've moved into the second enemy of a person of knowledge, which is clarity. And that's where you can actually see things clearly in your life. And you you can guide them and orchestrate them. And you can navigate and you get a lot of confidence from doing that. And you you win. Um, But you get complacent. They say a lot of times people that are, you know, in that stage are are complacent. Um, And so eventually clarity if you keep going will give way to power and um the same thing power is also a trap it's higher than clarity but if you rest there then you you can risk becoming egomaniacal you know you can you can wield your power for good but the temptation to wield it for bad for for very powerful people is it's right there all the time and so a lot of people will kind of go to the dark side but their power and then the final one, which it's, it sounds a little bit cruel, but the final enemy uh, of a person of knowledge is just old age. And they say, this is the one that you, you technically can't really conquer. You know, it's, it's associated with death, which is designed as a, an, an archetype. Maybe the only archetype that you can, you can truly depend on is death. And it's designed to um, wake us up to life while we're here, you know, to value each moment and to make decisions according to our highest and best good. And, um, and, and it, it does go into ways in which you can, uh, w- when you do pass through that doorway known as death, if you have done all the correct work of releasing um, your programs, your foreign installation, uh, your pride and, and, and all these other things, then you have a you can have a moment of no fear, perfect clarity, 
and full power when you die. Mm -hmm. and, to, and to them, that's the entire goal. It's just this moment of, you know, dying with, I guess you could say the ultimate grace, not being afraid of it, having power, knowing who you are, you know, um, being totally present with it. And they, they say that they go into different sections, but they say that if you, if you can accomplish this, you sort of make a double of yourself and that that's a whole nother thing, but you do that throughout the course of your life. And that the, uh, the Eagle, which is just another word for God, the Eagle, which is designed is designed to consume. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's predatory in a sense, but it, it can, it creates and destroys all the time. And so it will take your double as payment or as food, and you can kind of, uh, slip by death. That's, that's what they say. Now that's a whole nother topic. It's very cryptic and I do know kind of where it goes. Um, but it's, it's too long to get into, but, but it just, again, it just echoes. You have this, this, uh, hierarchy of evolution, ag flap, flap and cap, and, and they have theirs too, although it's a little more simple. Um, let me see if I can read, I want to read another little passage for you. Um, this kind of jumps into the one of the five primal powers, which would be um, masculine, feminine, right? The first one. So I wanted to see what you thought of this. Um, through their seeing, they discovered that the world of energy is made up of extreme areas of darkness, sprinkled with tiny points of light. And they perceive that the dark areas correspond to the feminine part of the energy, while the bright areas correspond to the masculine. They arrived at the inevitable conclusion that the universe is almost in its entirely feminine and the bright energy, the masculine, is rare. Um, and then it says, by definition, they are associated, they associated darkness with the left side, the nagual, the unknown, and the feminine, and the luminosity of the right side, the tonal, the known, and the masculine. Interesting. So, yeah, just before I taught the first primal power course and, and the module on the masculine feminine archetype, I actually had a, a, an opposite view uh, based on, for example, I, I studied in India and some of the traditional work there, and, uh, and that would have been a perfect fit with that. So I'm very curious now that, um, it, does the Toltec, for example, consider which, which is masculine and which is feminine, the, the sun or the moon? Okay. So first of all, Tol, Tole in Nahuatl language means sun. Mm. So Toltec is, is of the sun, but it doesn't, it's not negating the feminine. It's just that the tonal, which is what is the known can only bar, we can only articulate what the known. So that's masculine. It, it doesn't mean that the feminine is not there present and existing. It's just that it's, it's a little bit more mysterious. So it's hard for us to articulate it. And so, um, the, the so dark, this, the dark feminine and, and so the known masculine. Yeah. So to try to answer your question, um, the, the sun is masculine for them and the moon would be feminine for them. And I actually still hold this. I wrote a book called sun King, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about the harmonics of the sun and it is, it is, it's, yeah, it's a whole nother thing, but, um, but they, the Mexican, the word Mexico uh, in Nahuatl, which I can't pronounce it, it would be something else like Mashico or something like that. It means people of the navel of the moon. Mm. That, that's what the word Mexico means. And the Toltecs are from Mexico, right? So even though it's a, they're called Toltecs, but they also call themselves the people of the navel of the moon. And so the sun would be masculine, the known, the um the more left brain the and and the the moon represents even though it is a light in the sky it represents the darkness because it comes out at night you know well it's out all the time but we don't we only see it at mostly when there's darkness around it so they would say that the energy of the universe is mostly feminine and that these star let's say the stars and the sun um, with the exception of the moon, are 
masculine there it's kind of like the darkness is the the unknown we we can perceive it but we can't really know it and then the only way we could even attempt to know it is in contrast right so the the lights the stars are masculine and we can we can know those and of course you can't have one without the other so hopefully that answers your question <laughs> yeah, it's really fun. Uh, Benjamin Balderson helped to just completely muddy the waters of this for me because it's where I was at. If you read my book journey, you'll you'll see some references to the masculine feminine that are similar. And uh, and so, uh, you know, according to him, the it's really the other way around that um, and maybe for the same reasons. So they might very well have come to the same thing. Uh, so I'm not trying to negate by any means, but but he would say that uh, it's actually the the moon is masculine, providing the um, ignition to the feminine sun. So when you say known or light, I think it can still work because it, it is a spark of ignition. Um, yeah, my mind gets well, with this. Well, the, yeah. the, the, only, uh, the only other place in all of my studies, and I've studied, you know, Egyptian cosmology, Vedic cosmology, uh, obviously the magical Western tradition of alchemy and zodiac and all that stuff. Um, the only other place I've seen the moon being masculine is in the Bach saga. I was um, just looking at that last night. That's so funny you say that. Yeah, so there, I put a couple of videos up on my channel of, of the Bach saga as well. Um, I, it's It's... It's a whole, it's a super deep dive and it's an, it's a fascinating story, fascinating book. There's some things in there that will rock most people's uh, philosophical and psychological world. Um, but there is a logic to them when you open yourself up and you read it and you go, Hmm, they're not just making stories up. There's, there is a, a true logic to it, um, which kind of makes you think, huh, could some of this stuff be true? Um, but they're the only place that they that I've seen the uh, moon being masculine, and they call it a king, the king in the sky. Mm -hmm. And I've I've actually talked to uh, Jim Chesner personally about it, and we've gone back and forth. I said, no, no, this is this is what I think. He said, no, this is what I think. Um, but I would say, you know, overall, it just in intuitively for me, the, the sun, we call a young boy when it's born a son mm -hmm. and that's not arbitrary there's a reason for that it's because he masculine represents that type of light that or that type of energy um and so that's that that's kind of almost unanimous around the world they don't necessarily use the word sun it's an english word or whatever but the equivalent of so in, for me the sun is masculine and the moon would be feminine and there's another reason for this is that uh, if you believe science, um, the moon doesn't create its own light. When we see the moon, it's a reflection of the sun's light. No. Okay. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's, I know there's debate about that. Um, the dark side of the moon and stuff like that. Go ahead. Sorry. I was no, no problem at all. But, uh, if you ask any child, is the is the moon reflecting light or is it its own light source? I love this. I asked I asked a whole ton of children last year. They all say it's its own light source unless they've already been indoctrinated. But uh, but that's probably because they don't understand what the concept of reflection is. It's a it's kind of a heavy concept for a child, you know, for light to bounce off of something. It's just like if you they look you know they look at some like we kind of know that if you look at an object. The only reason why we're able to see it is because light is is reflecting off of it. It try to teach that to like a you know a young child. They're like, what? What does that mean? I just see it. It's there, you know. So, yeah, I I, I don't know. I just uh, I, it was I was very interested in in that perspective. And then there's there's um, it is all impossible to prove, but in terms of holograms that are, uh, you know, the, the moon might very well be a hologram and, and holograms also can be a light source. It's, it, it's for, for example, like when you see the hologram of an ice cube, it's cold. And actually that's the nature of the moon too. It's, it's the moon will give off cold energy. Mm -hmm. It's colder in the moonlight than it is in, in the, uh, 
block of moonlight or or something like that. But uh, yeah, this it's fun, and I also wonder if there's there's at some level some oversimplification, right? So if if the which is no doubt, right? We're we're oversimplifying everything for the sake of just being able to have any conversation or, or right. meeting minds whatsoever. Right. But you know, it would, so so the that that masculine moon being the the ignition and 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 setting the sun, which is likely not to be fire, because if it was a ball of fire, it's not it would burn us up. Yeah, exactly. It's not. It's energy. It's electricity. Yes. So it, not yeah. not to, not to stop you there, but um. When you say you know the moon is cold, well, in my understanding of, of physics, again Walter Russell, one of the giants, you know Tesla as well, Schauberger, they all say, well, the sun is not a ball of fire; um, it doesn't radiate heat like a fire does. It, the inverse square law: as you move closer to it, it gets inversely more intense because the when you leave the Earth at Earth's atmosphere from from the Earth's atmosphere to the sun, it's freezing cold. Space is cold. So that means the sun can't be acting on the same physics of a actual ball of fire or a fire. The distance between earth and sun is freezing cold. So it must be something else. And I do think that the electric universe model is the most accurate. Um, you know, things get hot in the sun, not due to the sun being a heat source, but due to the type of wavelength that it produces. And when waves go through a lens, they bend and they get closer together. And the closer, closer waves are together, heat is created. So it's only hot in our atmosphere because our atmosphere acts as a lens or an optic. Hopefully that makes sense. And so, uh, yeah, I've, I've been, uh, I was flat smacked in the last couple of years. And uh, so we, we don't have to go into that because I know it would be a big diversion, but I, I don't see any proof for there being anything outside that we, that we, could, we could actually know outside. My senses tell me it's all inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, Well, let me, let me read a little bit more. This, this, I just, maybe this will um, add a little bit to the, to the masculine feminine, feminine uh, concept. It says, continuing their observations, they saw that the act of galactic creation happens when the cosmic darkness contracts itself and from and from it arises an explosion of light a spark that expands giving origin to the order of time and space the law of this order is that things always have an end which again implies that the unique and perennial principle of the universe is dark energy feminine creative and eternal Hmm. Interesting. So what I what it's saying is that most of the universe is feminine. Um, it says dark, negative, and eternal. And negative doesn't mean bad. Yeah. It it's the apophatic thing. It's how we learn. It's to negate what we think we know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that energy that creates all the other energy that we do see, which you know all of us come through a female to get here. So I think. I think yeah. that's where they got that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say about the sun. That it's it's who births the sun, uh, but the feminine, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I probably can't with any authority go go any deeper into that. But uh, it's uh, it, it, yeah. So those those masculine and feminine it also it, it's an artificial breaking out, right? That's there's no two things. That's something I'm more and more aware of. Yep. And so, and so the action is, is more complex, more related. It's, it's like a, a spinning ball of its own. Yes. It's energy. all, it's all in curves. It's in, it's, it comes out in the phi sequence, you know, Kepler proved this, that all the planets are spaced out perfectly with phi, the most common ratio in the, in the universe. And, and that is a curve or it's a spiral actually. But when you look at part of it, it's a, it's a curve. Um, well, maybe I know that time is like coming up short here, but maybe you could, um, so since we talked about the masculine feminine archetype, um, and I went through the primal power course, which I recommend other people look at your work and, and, you know, consider working with you, um, because it does, it does offer a, a way in which to, um, release programming, or I should say deprogram yourself, uh, sort of. Uh, unknow 
what you think you are. <laughs> um, but maybe you could go through the other four primal power archetypes since we we touched on the masculine feminine and just kind of explain what those are if you don't mind absolutely and thank you very much for your kind words about primal power which it was super fun to watch people actually get it it's a you know it's one thing when i get it but when other people get it, it's like wow well that's a that's a that's a very unique talent that you have created that's not every not everybody can do that mm, so that yeah. that's that's why it's so effective you have that ability mm, thank you yeah, so the, the next archetype in the primal collection, if you can call it that, is the child that we talked a little bit about, uh, who tends to shadow into denial, not wanting to look at things, um, intensely afraid of betrayal and abandonment, which is a betrayal. And by overcoming those experiences, you actually rise into the reason you're really in denial and what you need to be betrayed by is your sacred purpose. We all came here for, now this is a, a misnomer to say we came here for something that's, that does lead people astray. Purpose is not like, oh, I'm going to be a farmer and I'm going to be a, uh, you know, in the lab with my alchemy things that can of course be part of, of purpose, but it's, it's a general direction, inclination, kind of a, uh, a blueprint. Why are you on that side of the camera? And I'm on this side of the camera and you wrote those books and I wrote this book and, you know, so and something calls us, it is a major risk. It is a, a, an abandonment of your uh, illusion of your ignorance. And, and the move forward into the hero's journey, it's terrifying. It, it, it um, has the fear of dying uh, print <laughs> in it, right? Like you, you, yeah. you, it's like you're going to your death when you say, okay, God, I'm coming. I don't even, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know if I'm going to live through it. You won't actually, like you said at the beginning, right? Like that death is the one, one level of programming you can't get out of. And, uh, and so the, the child archetype, now these are not necessarily sequential. They can, I see them more circular. They're present all the time. They're kind of in your face all the time with the same exact thing about your life and your death. It's the razor's edge, all of them. So the next archetype that, uh, that comes up is the victim. This mm -hmm. is where personal power is tied up, where you find your authority at, at the most esoteric and, and literal level. So more literal, being able to stand up for yourself, stand up for your rights, actually author your life, create your life, author documents, write letters, say bleed into, into the legal world a little bit here. We're all under the power of other people because we've agreed to work in, in where, where others are the authority, right? We don't even own our birth certificate. We are not the author of that. That's not us. Give unto Caesar what is Caesar. So that's not us, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, truthers default into a very uh, high energy of the victim, which tends to make them the perpetrator, like we talked earlier. And then the, the, the awakened victim has personal power that speaks for itself. You don't need to go and lord over anybody. You don't need to virtue signal. You don't need to uh, hurt yourself in order to get people's attention. It's it's power and authority that speaks for itself. And it is a draw. People will follow you. Lots of overlap there with the king archetype as well, which you, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the next archetype, very prickly, the prostitute. This is the one that has a step out of our integrity, do the thing that we know we absolutely shouldn't do. It's outside of our values. It's outside of our knowledge. It's not in alignment with even our you know, mission, what we're doing here on earth. And so when you do that thing, you lose power, you lose energy, you become more vulnerable to doing it again and, and in a deeper way, in a more harmful, self-compromising way. So you need faith to not go along with that. When someone says, oh yeah, just take the jab and your kid can go to school. Just take the jab and you can buy groceries. <laughs> just take the jab and you can get on an airplane, right? So that's that's where we're headed and pretty damn quick over here in Canada, I have to say uh, yeah. as well, right? We're being kicked out of Babylon. I can feel that. But the beauty is uh, just to back to the, the apathetic, the unlearning, it is a releasing of Babylon. So Babylon's not kicking me out. I'm not the I'm not the victim. I don't have to prostitute to be part of Babylon. I am releasing Babylon. It's coming out of me uh, on a regular basis. And and it's just so clear that I that's not my world. It's not my Babylon. And I don't need to chase it for safety, which is what the prostitute would have done. 
the last primal archetype, which is to me the 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 kicker of all all uh, powers that we don't access as human beings, is that of free will of choice, and uh, the archetype that governs over that, if you can call it, that's that's not probably accurate. It's not a government, but uh, the one that's related with it is the saboteur. So many people walk with that saboteur. I know it's it's kicked my butt over the years and like very recent, you know, I just, I just barely managed to squeak out of sabotaging something was really important, getting some support in my work now, because things are a little bit more than I, a lot more than I can handle personally. And I saw myself about to sabotage that relationship and I didn't, <laughs> and it was a miracle and it kept growing and now it's a seed and it's sprouting and can grow and, and good things can happen. So that the, when you burn the bridge, you eliminate the choice. You close the door on something and that door might not open again. So by walking very mindfully and seeing like, yeah, okay, that doesn't resonate with me. And maybe there was some kind of psychic injury, but I don't have to put a big X on that or, or push that person out of my life. Like I got a graveyard of people behind me that, uh, you know, I hope at some point, forgive me, <laughs> but that's, that's. Uh, you know, I'm learning now how to maintain openness and not have to be in uh, the, you know, the perfect understanding with everybody that everybody has something to contribute. You do have your people and that's where you're going to be able to um, find your free will of choice most easily because there's some support and reflection for that, that people can ping it back to you if i talk about in, in bear's language i'm, I'm going to be pinging all over the place now yeah <laughs> yep. after that bear lando just to say his name and so th this is the one that some people think we don't even have free will that it's all destiny that it's all just you know it doesn't matter what you do it's going to play out a certain way but this is absolutely a co-creation and guess what who you're co-creating with your creator that's you it's a totality so it's not even co-creator, there's not two anymore. And and you always have the choice. So as long as you pretend you don't, then you don't. It's gonna feel like people are forcing you that you cannot uh, have a breakthrough. You cannot do what you want to do. But, and that's a, that's a big inversion, by the way, of free will of choice and we're being attacked. Uh, I saw a meme yesterday going against this, that, that it was free, dumb, D-U-M-B right? It's, it's weaponizing freedom. You can't say that word anymore. It's, oh, it's, oh, right. it's now in the hands of perpetrators, right? Uh, so, so the free will of choice, it's not, it's not that free dumb where you, where you get to do whatever you want to do as thou wilt. That's the satanic side the in, of this. The, in, the inversion. Yeah. The inversion. Exactly. So true freedom, true free will of choice, which is identical with freedom is, uh, is a, a position of uh, servitude. It's like, yes, God, I'm, uh, I will uh, accept that opportunity, that choice, that, that, you know, keep that door open. It's always a yes, God, yes, God, yes, God. You, you would really, um, you know, so some people might argue that's not free will of choice either, but it, it must be chosen. Our perpetrators know if they go against our free will of choice and break the covenant, the cost is the ultimate cost. That's what God is promising in the book of Enoch that, you know, yep. where it's all heading. We're at that time now. We're breaking the covenant all over the place. Yeah. You know, beating the hell out of kids in, in uh, India to get a jab. Yeah. 200, 200 of them just died from the jab. That's like over 200 now, just directly from the jab. Uh, you know, <clears throat> yeah. Well, I'm with you on all of that. Um, maybe you could... Um, Thank you for going through all all five of those because that they they help people that you know understand w what these are and that they're they're a part of themselves. Um, but maybe you could, if you have time, maybe you could briefly just talk about how releasing a program is is or I should say can be should be or at some yeah I guess is permanent. Like there's a way in which, like you said, um, you close the door on it and a new, a new root is growing. And so you no longer play that old program. You know, it's like sort of like taking the red pill and stepping out of the matrix. Right. Um, but maybe you could just talk about the releasing of a program if you have time. Totally. Sure. Yeah. I can, uh, 
I think I can take another 10 minutes. Oh yeah. Okay. If you have to go, no worries, but yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah. So the, the reason that it doesn't work to let go of one feeling at a time, again, back to Lester Levinson's work, I just want to give him credit because uh, he, he was absolutely a genius in decoding this stuff. And I've followed in his footsteps uh, with this and, uh, you know, they're made, made some minor adjustments to it, but the work has incredible integrity. Uh, so, so underneath the experiences that we're aware of is the unconscious programming. And it will appear to be a, like, just absolute chaos. Like there's, a, you can't even begin with it. It feels like hell. Uh, those, those discrete programs can, can join up together and cluster, which in nature, there's often clustering and they become a kind of wall that you can't get past and, and do your best not to sabotage. Say, say, you know, you're always on the precipice of success and you always shoot yourself in the foot and, and you know it and you see it and you don't want to do it. And you plan differently every single time, but every single time you do it, and why is that? What is the mystery? And why are you holding your head going, no, no. And, and <laughs> it, it is, right? It is, it is the nature of the unconscious it, because it's got more um, gravity, more pull. If gravity is real in the way we think it is, it has a big pull just because of its size and its collective nature. So it's, it's always there to default into that unconscious and, and the programming is telling you that uh, you're going to die. Nobody loves you. You're not in control. You, you cannot be the totality. You cannot be one with yourself, with your own mind, your own heart, your family, your loved ones, your earth, uh, anything, right? Like it, it, the program will just say, it's a big no, you need, and, and on the other side is because you can't be um, you can't survive. You must want that because you can't get loved. You must want that because you can't be in control. You must want that because you can't be one. You must want it. And it's the wanting that sets up. It's a kind of glue. It's like a, it's like a resistance and it locks everything on top of it into place. And so if you are brave and you, you're up in courage, acceptance, or peace, you'll have the ability to start playing with it and going like, oh, wow, you're screaming at me that I'm going to die. Oh, poor thing. Are you afraid? Come here. Let me, let me look at you very, very closely and see what's wrong. And I'm going to study that energy rather than repel myself away from it and go as deep into the, uh, uh, you know, away from awareness as I can from it, I, I'm going to go the other direction, like the buffalo who run into storms. They see the storm coming, they go headlong into it, because they know that's the fastest way through it. And that's, that's the flip, you know, we're in the inversion experience now of running away from our experience. Now you can go the other direction and even into the worst possible unconscious experience of not surviving. And so once you challenge that and you, and you look into it, it begins to dissolve. Stuck energy begins to move. It's hard to, it's hard to pin it down because we're not really in the realm of, of that form anymore, but it can be known nonetheless. Once you touch down and you let yourself feel that want for survival or the want to die is actually another, another expression of that. And, uh, and, and, you, and you go into it, you let it be there, you're in acceptance of it, you're no longer giving it your life force by pushing it away and resisting it, then you can make a new choice. You've always had the choice, but the choice was tacit, it was unconscious. And uh, as, you, as you mentioned, it's from childhood where those choices were made. Some people would even say choices, they're not real choices. You did what you had to do. But I think it's still, it's still in the realm of choice because why does one kid uh, end up with this situation in their life and the same kid could be identical twins didn't at mm. some level there is choice not blame but choice and so when you you see the program you see for what it is you make a new choice and you say actually I want freedom I don't want to be chased by fear anymore this is not my true nature it's not who I am this is Babylon. this is the death cult this is the the, the creation of this gnostic mysteria if i if i quote michael tesarian right? yeah yeah right and uh, it's an, oh it's not me ah what a revelation that's not who i am i can let that go and that you're instantly rewarded if you can call it that 
by a rising of power. That's why the the symbol for primal power is a geyser, right? Energy just poof. Yeah, I have it on your website here. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 it gives way, it frees up energy because, uh, you know, the stronger you're suppressing something in the unconscious, it's really good news when you unsuppress because that's how much energy be becomes available to you. And that energy wants to work for you in, in your life. It wants to create everything that you want, you know, happiness and good health and good relationships and abundance and, and uh, powerful connection with people and God and purpose. All it, that's, that's what we're doing here. That, that is nature's way. And so by letting go of the, the, that fear programming, you, you can work with nature. And that has a lot of power. If you think the unconscious has power, but we just wait till you have nature as the wind behind your sails. Absolutely. Well, that's, that's a perfect way to, I think, end the conversation as a brilliant explanation. Um, but real quick, maybe you could just tell people how they can find you. You know, I mean, I know it's bethmartins.com. Uh, they can find you there, but maybe you, if you want to talk about your book or where they can find that or um, a new program that you might be have coming up, just go ahead and do that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. So I do have a copy of my book here. It's um, Journey, a Map of Archetypes to Find Lost Purpose in a Sea of Meaninglessness. So I'm a book behind. Primal Power is my next book. And that's why I run the course two times in a row. I've got all the material. So it's um, ready to go. And probably it'll be another year before I'm back to it. But this is about the hero's journey and that rise up and out of that child denial and fear of betrayal to say, okay, I'm, I'm coming. There's no way around it. <clears throat> I almost died of cancer, re refusing my calling. And so I write about that extensively in this book, how I got to the other side by using the power of archetypes and by following the hero's journey, which I in, at that time was not aware of. It took me 20 years to decode the whole entire thing. Yep. But the fact was that even working with one archetype, I was able to recover enough energy to save my life from cancer. So it, it is really a, a beautiful study. It doesn't matter where you enter into it, but you are on the hero's journey, whether you're refusing it or you're accepting it. To me, this time is like no other, uh, that if we all, or enough of us, all is a bad word, but if enough of us go on our hero's journey, it will be the thing, it will be the remedy that is needed in order to create the world that is wanted. Now, I know we have a big divide, a different, different subject for a different day. And uh, so the Primal Power course is uh, now available as an online course. So if you've missed the last two live courses, I will run a live course again in the future, not uh, too, too long from now, but in the meantime, you can go and you can look at the archetype cards for the five archetypes. You can see the um, uh, videos from the first course. You can hear audios from the second course. Get a number of resources to help you map out your experience and see the ag flap and cap scale as a as a graphic so you don't have to just have it all abstract in your mind and uh, so that is that is now available you can go to my website just click on primal power and uh, you can get instant access to everything there uh, if you don't mind me saying I'll also i'm not sure the timing of when this is going to come out but um, I, and I haven't talked about this at all, but uh, I was born and raised in, by entrepreneurs in a business world. And so one of the things that I see happening right now is people are losing their jobs. They're being forced to prostitute to, um, you know, maybe they're a business owner, but they can't stay in business without jumping through all the government's hoops. Uh, or they're, they, they simply don't want to stay in that job that is costing them integrity. So I'm running a business training that on June 6th, there is an info meeting about it. It's limited to only 10 people. Three spots are already spoken for before I even really put it out. And it will be teaching people how to create a business out of their life purpose. The thing that I was dying of, <clears throat> that I, I didn't follow my passion. I, I followed something that I thought was going to be like the road to my real purpose. But I, I uh, God said, don't go sideways. You got to go direct. <laughs> So this is training to help you create uh, a clear audience, know who you work for, and to uh, create a signature system to decode how did you get past everything in your life and come out the other side victorious in certain ways, maybe not all the ways, probably not all the ways, but that shouldn't stop you from helping people now. And, uh, and then you'll come out of that to having something actually to sell, a package, a program, 
so people can get to work with you uh, right away and you can have income in a way that you can decide everything. You have total, total free will when you're in that kind of a business. Wow. So, Uh, so needed, so needed right now. Thank you. Yeah. It was, God was telling me to do it. I didn't even really feel like doing it, but I saw the need and people are asking and I'm a business nerd. It's just, it's something I, uh, even talking about it, I can hear my enthusiasm for it. It's, uh, it's super fun. It's not easy. You know, it's, we're, we're used to being taken care of in a lot of ways, especially that job, J-O-B. And uh, so, you know, if you're ready to be self-responsible and take, take a, a you know, take pride in, in the fact that you are creating your world and, and it's going to not only be something for you and your family, but for all of humanity at some level the energy that you can cultivate and uh and that's that is purpose it's that your connection how you contribute so it's a a really on point kind of a process and uh, we also have a law summit coming up you heard me say a few things about the law yep so choose freedom law summit matt belair and myself are hosting a number of the heavy hitters out there in the in the law world not the legal world this is uh, systems that will take you outside of the legalities, help you pull apart and deprogram the law out of your system. This will be a next course I haven't created yet. I've done one podcast on, and it's the archetypes of the law, so that we can let go of those shadows that are so deep and keep us answering to, uh, you know, psychopathic perpetrators, and even turning to them. That's the victim archetype from the primal power, actually turning. To perpetrators for safety you mean you mean turn into the people that wear uh wool and pull the wool over your eyes while you're in court <laughs> and they always dress in black you mean those people yep you got it <laughs> exactly ryan no, the wigs exactly. the wigs <sighs> unbelievable unbelievable yeah. but you know here we are and uh at the end of the day it, you can't go <clears throat> and wake anybody up you can only wake yourself up uh, that's God's game to make it fun. And so if you do the work on yourself, then you become the invitation to others and you'll be able to communicate with them in a way that if they can hear and want to hear and need to hear what you have to say, then you will be, you have that clarity to hear, or they will, pardon me, to speak to them and, and be present with them. So, you know, having said that also, there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of wisdom that it can be passed on. Every time I hear one of these speakers, we're, we're interviewing Cal Washington today for the, the speaker, if you're not familiar with him from Empower Movement, they all have incredible energy, the, the absolutely defaulting in courage and higher with uh, connections to the divine. You can't really be effective in, in a lawful way without that connection. That's why God figures very, very high in this. And uh, so, yeah, that, that is a free summit you can join in. The first interviews roll out the weekend of June 4th. And, uh, but when you sign up, you'll get access to everything that will come out on a, on a weekend basis so that you can digest it. Uh, the very last thing, if you don't mind, I'll say is no, that go you, ahead, can, yeah. you can visit bethmartins.com to do an archetype quiz that is related to the, the hero's journey. And it's important to know who you are, but it's also very important to know where you are. And that gives you clues about how to begin working because all you really need, oh, there you go. You've got the- uh, Well, the primal power questionnaire quiz there. Oh, right. That's different. Yeah. <laughs> there's, so yeah. Many, there's so many bits and pieces of, of work now. And, and this, so this one, you can sign up right on my homepage, bethmartins.com. There are two of them because I worked for women for 15 years, helping them mostly to be building businesses and to deprogram and and do all of that work in the back end that when they get scared, they need to do. And uh, so if you do the Merpreneur Archetype Quiz, then you'll find out where you are on the path of being valued for your purpose. And that's a little bit more geared towards the way women get stuck in that. And there's a second quiz called the King Heroes Journey Quiz, which is a little bit more geared towards men now, having said that, men and women do all of them. I'm noticing this. They're, they, even though I'm saying explicitly what they're for, uh, we have the masculine and feminine inside of us. They are the identical archetypes. So chances are you will um, get more or less the same answer from one quiz as the other. But uh, once you find out where you are and you see a shadow and you decide, I'm, that's not my beautiful shadow. I'm not wanting to stay stuck there anymore. I don't want to have that experience anymore then you can start to have a new experience almost right away. 
uh, not to make light, it's, it's, um, I think God always gives you that, what is it called? Beginner's luck or, <laughs> you know, some kind of, it's kind of like spring energy when everything just goes forward, but it doesn't necessarily, you know, challenges are inevitable. You need those challenges. It, it, it really truly is what will cause you to grow. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. You are, I know you're very busy. You've got a lot going on, but it's all so good and so necessary. And, uh, you. uh you know, what little I've engaged with, with you and, and on your website, has been excellent. Um, so I encourage other people who are listening to, to check it out and I'll do, I will get this out before June 6th. That should be, should be no problem. Okay. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. so I'll just leave it there and just say, thank you. I really appreciate your time. I know you have to move on to another interview. Um, and, uh, just, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for creating the course courses. Um, and, uh, hopefully I'll, you know, be in touch with you in the future. No doubt. Thank you so much, Ryan, for your very sincere presence in the course, your contributions, the etymology that you added was uh, awesome. And I love your podcast. I love what you're doing. And uh, I have to check out your books. I'll send you one. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah oh, sure. I'll, yeah, I'll sure. Send, I'll send you one too, then. That would be excellent. I would appreciate that. Okay, fantastic. Um, okay, very well, good. take care and I'll see you on the flip side. Okay, thanks very much. Bye right. for now. Bye.